It's episode 83 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show. This podcast provides the tools you need to create your own expression of a healthy ketogenic lifestyle so you can stop obsessing and start living. I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. Now, let's get on with the show. Hey, hey, friends. Welcome back. Thanks, as always, for joining me on this episode of Keto for Women and yet another very special guest that I know you all are going to love listening to and learning from. Can't wait to get to our guest today and the conversation that we had. That was just great. Just two minds that think very much alike in this keto space, getting together and having a chat, which I know you all love. We will get right to that very quickly. First, let's hear a word from one of our amazing speakers sponsors. I have exciting news coming from our friends over at Rasa. I know a lot of you are already on the Rasa train, but for those of you who haven't tried it yet, Rasa coffee is a coffee alternative that's made of adaptogens with no caffeine. These adaptogens are super herbs. They help you combat and cope with stress while also providing a natural and healthy energy boost. The biggest question I get about Rasa is, does it taste like coffee or what does it taste like if it doesn't taste like coffee? And I will tell you, no, it doesn't taste like coffee, but it does still provide that hearty, robust, earthy, warm beverage that you want in the morning when you wake up. I know that's kind of the first thing I crave when I wake up. And Rasa does it for me without the caffeine or the jittery feeling that comes with it. The cool thing is that now Rasa has come out with two new flavors and you are going to want to get your hands on them. First, there's the Cacao Rasa. This is a blend of the original Rasa with cacao beans. The combo creates a rich chocolatey beverage that is so good and it's great as a mid-afternoon pick-me-up. Has less than five milligrams of caffeine, so it makes for a very non stimulating coffee alternative that you can have at any time throughout the day. And it's packed with those great adaptogens and antioxidants. I've been whipping mine up with some coconut cream in the middle of a chilly day, and it really hits the spot for that little mid afternoon treat. But keep in mind, there's no sweetener at all, which is great for us keto ladies. And that means it gives you that chocolatey flavor without the sweetness. You guys are going to love it. It's also still going to do all those same great benefits to support your adrenals and your stress response while giving you a little bit of a boost midday. Then there's the Dirty Rasa, which contains a little bit of organic, fair trade, women grown and operated coffee mixed in with their original Rasa. This does have a little bit of caffeine for those days when you just need a little extra pizzazz in your day and also great for those looking to slowly wean themselves off of caffeine or just drink a little bit less caffeine. It's kind of Rasa's idea of a half-calf situation, but again, you're getting those adaptogens, you're getting that health health benefit of the original Rasa at the same time. Now, I've actually been mixing both of the two flavors together as my morning pick-me-up, and I have to say it is so yummy. You've got to try it, especially blended with some healthy fats like coconut cream, ghee, coconut oil, MCT oil. Blend that up. It will really hit the spot, whether it's in the morning or maybe even mid-afternoon. Our friends over at Rasa, they love us here at Keto for Women, which means they're giving us 20% off of your order when you go to wearerasa.com. Use the coupon code KETO, the number four women, and you will get 20% off your order. Again, that's wearerasa, R-A-S-A, dot com. Use the coupon code KETO, the number four women, and get 20% off your order over on their website. A huge thanks to Rasa for helping this show come to air and for that amazing deal they're giving to all of us. All right, moving on to our guest today, Allie Miller. I know many of you know her already, have heard her on other podcasts. I first met Allie at KetoCon last year in 2018 and heard her talk all about anxiety and how keto helps with that, along with a whole host of other lifestyle and supplemental factors that are involved. And I knew right away that I needed to have her on the show because there are so many of you out there dealing with symptoms 
of anxiety or depression or other mental health issues and not really knowing what to do, where to turn, what steps to take. So we have her, the expert on the show today. Allie Miller is a registered and licensed dietitian and certified diabetes educator with a contagious passion for food as medicine and developing clinical protocols and virtual programs using nutrients and food as the foundation of treatment. Her food as medicine philosophy is supported by up-to-date scientific research for a functional approach to healing the body. Allie is a renowned expert in the ketogenic diet with over a decade of clinical results using a unique whole foods approach to a high fat, low carb protocol. Allie's message has influenced millions through media with television segments, features in O, Women's Health and Prevention Magazines, her award-winning podcast, Naturally Nourished, and within the medical community. Allie's expertise can be accessed through her website, AllieMillerRD.com, offering her blogs, podcasts, virtual learning, and access to her practice, Naturally Nourished. All right, without further ado, let's hear from Allie. Allie, thank you so much for coming on Keto for Women today. Oh, I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I know we're going to have an amazing conversation already because we are so similar. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be a lot of fun. This will be good. Okay. So first of all, of course, we want everyone to know who you are, where you came from, what you do, and how you got into it all. So let's start there. Okay. So in a nutshell, my name is Allie Miller RD. I Went to a naturopathic college of medicine, which is what kind of sets me apart from most dietitians. So I am a registered dietitian. I'm also a certified diabetes educator, but at my naturopathic college, I really started my foundations to be very grounded in nature. And I marry both the allopathic kind of conventional medical model with the naturopathic model with practice of what's called functional integrative medicine. So functional medicine is really looking at addressing the root cause of chronic conditions or undesired symptoms. So rather than silencing the symptoms and putting up roadblocks, I'm always working with each patient as like a detective of their body and trying to determine not only what the root cause is, maybe it's inflammation or hormone imbalance or micronutrient deficiency, but also what were the triggering events because that's going to play a big role in whole body health and really optimizing that individual's body. Uh, so great. And so how did you even get into this from the start? Was it something within yourself or your family members, something that really caught your attention? Well, so I was a dance major in college initially, and then, you know, had my like realization of, well, I'm only going to be able to teach dance, <laughs> not be a <laughs> professional. And I've already taught dance for four years in high school. So I took a little bit of time off. I worked at a, a hippie gem shop, I like to call it. <laughs> and then also started to really get into nutrition as my boyfriend now was doing some work in organic farming. So it was really kind of the sustainable food movement. We were members at our local co-op and started to do some gardening work and things like that, that really connected me into food. And honestly, I don't think I ate many vegetables outside of like the frozen triad, mm -hmm. <laughs> like cauliflower, peas, and carrot chunks. <laughs> I truly, like up until that awakening, I suppose, it really wasn't in my standard American diet upbringing. So that really got me into foods. And then when I went to Bastyr, I went on a whole journey outside of Seattle, Washington, learning about kind of being a locavore. I transitioned from a vegan diet to a paleo diet and then learned about keto in 2007 and 2009, started doing that in clinical practice after I was registered and the rest is kind of history. Wow. So how was it being a vegan? <laughs> Well, you know, I talk about it in my book, The Anti-Anxiety Diet, and kind of share my health story. And everyone I truly believe is biochemically unique. I don't believe that there's a perfect diet for everyone. What we need for our systems is going to ebb and flow with life cycle, with stress levels, with seasons, so many different factors. So I think that that's fair to acknowledge. And I think the positives of the vegan diet 
were that, like I said, I, I kind of learned to eat plants <laughs> because mm-hmm. by shaving things away, like when I first was vegetarian, it was just cheese, pizza, and mac and cheese. <laughs> and then, you know, I was like, okay, now I got to move away the cheese. Now I have to figure this out. So I think that there was a really cool awareness of plants and eating vegetables, but I also had the onset of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and panic attacks and anxiety all in in the time when I was vegan. And it really accelerated when I went raw vegan because Mm. I think I was eating so many anti-nutrients in plants, something that I didn't really know a lot about at the time. And that that paired with malnourishment, low B12, low iron, and all of the things I was missing from animal really kind of was the nail on the head. and, And I had to revamp my diet for sure. Oh, there's so many things that you brought up there that I want to touch on. <laughs> oh, darn. Okay. I always try not to. I'm like, what part of my story do I let go of this time? <laughs> well, first thing, can you talk a little bit more about the anti-nutrients? I don't think that's something that's discussed a lot, definitely within the vegan community, but even within people who are you know, a more plant-based keto or plant-based paleo that could be potentially doing some damage to themselves. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, thinking of it conceptually, I think is easy to think that, you know, plants can't run to defend themselves. So in their phytocompound structure or their plant-based cell walls and the nutrients that they provide, they also tend to have a lot of anti-nutrients or things that block the consumer from the absorption process. And so we're talking about things like oxalates or lectins. A lot of different plant compounds can have some gut damaging properties. They can also interfere with some metabolic processes like There's goitrogens, which can interfere with our thyroid health. So, you know, when I was sitting and eating like raw cabbage kale salad every day. (laughs) Ouch. Right, I know. Following (laughs) being a very heavily soy and vital wheat gluten, I was making seitan prior to going raw vegan. And so I was eating copious amounts of vital gluten, like concentrated gliadin (laughs) as my protein, my gut was quite distressed and my thyroid was less than happy. I had a a thyroid peroxidase that was over 800 and it's Mm -hmm. supposed to be under 35. So these anti-nutrients can both block the absorption of the nutrient that we say a food has, and they can also cause distress like drive leaky gut or interfere with metabolic process. Right. And it's not saying that we shouldn't be eating vegetables. I mean, we both are in the keto community touting real food keto and eat your vegetables and get this nice big plate of colorful things, right? So it's not that at all. Right. I think that that's a nice kind of connection to making harmony with the keto carnivore world is that I feel, again, kind of looking at a functional medicine approach It's why isn't your body tolerating X, Y, Z, you know? So for instance, like I know Maura and Danny, they do a lot of stuff with their fat fueled lifestyle and, you know, they both have done a lot of stents as keto carnivore. Well, when she did her MRT test, which is a inflammatory food test, Mm -hmm. she found lettuce was a big reaction for her. So no wonder why she didn't feel good eating leafy greens, right? And that's immunologically, that individual's body determined that she was going to release inflammation in response to that plant compound. Or if someone's dealing with leaky gut and they're eating like zucchini noodles raw, which have more lectins than some other plants, that might cause bloating or like a rawness or an aching. And Mm -hmm. so rather than avoiding these foods, I think it's important to get back to the foundations of maybe you do well for a period of time doing keto carnivore while you support your gut healing with like a, a copious amount, two quarts of bone broth a day, and you work an elimination diet if you don't want want to you know, invest in like inflammatory food panel, but you could do an elimination diet where in three to five day increments, you strategically test these different plant compounds and see what works best for your body. And then you use the nutritional wisdom that we've carried for hundreds of years of how to consume these foods, like massaging down the kale with your hands to mechanically break the cell wall and activate the enzymes and adding that good quality real salt, which has you know good electrolytes that'll help to also carry the nutrients into the body and, and reduce the goitrogen or negative impact of having those foods raw. 
Yes, so important. And really, there's a lot that can be changed and just learn just by giving yourself some tips for how to cook food. Right. And how to cook, you know, especially the vegetables, getting into different methods of cooking can do so much great stuff for your body and it tastes way better. <laughs> Absolutely right. Like acids and fats, you know, yeah. whether someone's doing, I can't tell you, I'm not, not a lot of keto people because they're pro fat, but so many of my clients are like, oh, well, I just do the salad on its own and I put the dressing on the side. I'm like, okay, I understand if it's low quality, like industrialized soybean oil dressing at a restaurant, <laughs> but like travel with your olive oil pack and you need to add that because you can't absorb vitamin K of your leafy greens if you don't have fat. And, Without it, yeah. Right, and you can't absorb your iron and your minerals if you don't have acid in your lemon or your lime or your balsamic. I uh, love it so much. All right. So in your story, you mentioned that you were starting to feel some anxiety when you were vegan. Was that kind of what triggered you to get really involved in learning more about anxiety and how to kind of potentially heal that and reverse it naturally? I kind of honestly shelved that because a lot of it regrounded. When I added animal product back into my diet. It was like a game change for mm -hmm. sure. I was very low ferritin, which is your iron storage in your body and very extremely anemic. So when I started eating ribeyes, <laughs> mm -hmm. that all really made a big change. And I did a lot of oysters being out in the Pacific Northwest at that time for CoQ10 and zinc and things like that. So I really got above water in a reasonable time frame, a couple months of transitioning my diet and then I kept kind of nerding out into nutritional sciences. And it really wasn't until I had my daughter in 2016 when anxiety kind of revisited me, I think in the postpartum hormone change. Mm -hmm. And that's when I was like, oh, hello, friend. <laughs> Here you are again. Because <laughs> I almost wasn't present for so long. And I think I was just kind of rock and roll in my career and all the things. And it was at that point, I had been doing a lot of work with what's called HPA access or our parasympathetic fight or flight system of the body. So our hypothalamus pituitary adrenals. And I had been doing a lot of work with women's hormones, like testing estrogen and progesterone and, and the role and the connection of cortisol. And I finally kind of had this aha moment after my daughter where I was like, if anxiety isn't managed, this is like the Achilles heel of this whole access. And I started to really make these very quick connected, literally like lightning bolt moment of like, oh, if anxiety isn't managed, our microbiome can get sterilized. And this is why that patient, Steve, is dealing with dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. And if anxiety isn't managed, we can actually have leaky gut and literally stress alone drills holes into our gut lining, you know? And so I started to kind of make this premise and that's kind of birthed the concept of the book that anxiety is the root cause that kind of even roots below things like inflammation, microbiome, micronutrients, and so forth, because it perpetuates imbalance in the body. So then is it pretty obvious if someone comes to you presenting with anxiety that they also have HPA dysregulation to some degree? Absolutely. Because they're running in some form of fight or flight mode. They're either stressed and wired or stressed and tired. And that's still creating that wired mentality as if you, you know, drove a car across country and you drove for 11 hours straight you're so tired, but you can't shut down. Right. And so we get both symptoms of anxiety of both the wiry, anticipatory, racing thoughts, difficulty concentrating, and also the so chronic fatigued, but not able to shut down and, and ground, if you will. Yeah. So in that case, then it seems like obviously really looking deeper into the stress components and perhaps doing a cortisol test, which I know you do some functional lab testing, really getting to the root of that stressor and how deep it goes is kind of the first step. Is that true? Yeah. Well, so my book breaks down six different entry points to managing anxiety. And the last two have to do more directly with the HPA axis. So in my book, I talk about removing inflammation actually as the, the first entry point, because we've seen in studies 
for instance, there's a marker C-reactive protein, and, and that's a marker of our inflammatory state in the body. And we see a trend of elevated CRP and higher expression of depression or anxiety because inflammatory chemicals, like our body's chemical warfare in response to inflammation, cross the blood-brain barrier, and there's like a wiry sensation of inflammatory chemicals that upregulate anxiety and don't allow our good neurotransmitters to dock. So I, I enter in with inflammation, and then I move into re storing the microbiome. So the role of our good gut bugs in manufacturing our feel-good receptors like serotonin and GABA, as well as how dysbiosis or bad bacteria can make epinephrine or adrenaline and make us feel more wiry. And then I go into repairing the gut lining. So once you've like reduced the inflammation, you've reset the biome, now you want to heal and seal the gut lining. And then I restore micronutrients. So I talk about the nutrients that play a role with mood stability and neurotransmitters. And then the last two, the five and six concept is rebounding the adrenals and then rebalancing neurotransmitters, which, you know, at an allopathic conventional model, we start at that end of right away a neurotransmitter medication mm-hmm. without even thinking about all of those earlier pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. And it seems like all six are going to be rooted in nutrition, just changing the diet. Oh yeah. And you know, Sean, it's interesting because you might think that you have to follow it sequentially, but that's kind of a part of my role as the detective of the body, right? Is to determine like, okay, so someone that just had maybe a baby and is breastfeeding, they might need to really hone in on restoring their micronutrient status because they just grew a human. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, like they're depleted micronutrients or someone that just ran a marathon, we might look more into the adrenal cortisol or micronutrients and someone that's dealing with rashing or hives and bloating and distension, we might dig deeper into doing like a candida cleanse. So I tried to give actually in my book at the end of each chapter a quiz so that you can really understand what part resonates with you stronger mm. because the food as medicine is important throughout the whole book, but like where you might need to invest in supplement strategy or advanced functional labs that will help you to kind of hone in on an entry point. Oh, that's so good because it is going to be different for everybody at different stages. Even the same person could be dealing with something down the road. That wasn't the case the last time their anxiety kicked in and may need to start somewhere different. Exactly. And that's where it can be confusing. It's just like anything, right? Like maybe you did really well on a certain plan, like protein modified fasting, and you lost that five pounds. You try it again. It doesn't work. It's like, Mm -hmm. why? Because you're a different being at that snapshot, at that entry point. Yeah. You've talked about that a few times and it's so important just taking a break from the anxiety point for a minute to really talk about that a little further. And I, I'm sure you see this all the time. I see this every single day. People get frustrated with themselves and their bodies and they get really into this negative headspace because what they're doing isn't working any longer. And that's because we've changed. You changed right. from yesterday to today even. Right, right. You got to shake it up. And I think it's probably fun for both of us in our client work, but also just like for the client or just like for ourselves as we're doing our own investigative work, it can be frustrating because there's no magic bullet. You know, it's not, it's not sexy to say that because it'd be really cool if there was, right? <laughs> but there isn't. <laughs> yeah. And, and we can't tell you which is the next path to go or why it's not working anymore. That's something that you, that person, that client has to do as their own detective work in understanding more about their body and being more intuitive with what they need at that time. We can give the guides, but it's up to that person to really understand their own body. Yeah. And That's where I I love one of my favorite mantras that I say all the time is doctrine creates disconnect. And, you know, it's like I experienced that when I was raw vegan. I experienced that at times of keto. And it's like when I was raw vegan and there were handfuls of my hair coming out Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I was like severely in autoimmune hypothyroidism, no one could have told me to eat meat. I had to make that piece of myself, you know, like because this was the way, this was the plan and I made whatever deal with whoever is involved, wherever, that that was the way. And the same thing with kind of keto world, this idea of maybe if we need to carb cycle, or maybe we need to eat less fat than that perfect macro wheel shows or more protein or whatever it is. It's that there's not this dogma that creates and manifests change. 
it's a constant evolving process. And when we connect with our body as the most important database, I think that's when we start to make strides of really whole body health care. Uh, I love it so, so much. So speaking my language right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to the anxiety. So I would assume that I'm sure this is the case in your practice, definitely something I see in a lot of women I work with. I assume there's a lot of women out there right now who are dealing with anxiety, have dealt with anxiety and have been put on medications by the conventional medical world. Mm -hmm. And they might not even be working or maybe that wasn't even a case where that was the right thing to do potentially. But for those people, what some tips you can give, I guess, or what have you seen in your practice to help maybe start shifting into more of a natural approach as well in order to really truly get that anxiety under control? Yeah. So the first thing I always make sure as a like foundational rule is, is the person getting enough protein is kind of the first and foremost thing that I think of. And because the importance of protein is that you're going to get amino acids and these are the building blocks for our neurotransmitters. Protein can have a very grounding impact on the body. And now with that being said, excess protein, I mean like really high amounts, like beyond two grams per kilogram a day can drive cortisol. We do see research studies that show that protein in excess can drive cortisol, but I see generally speaking, especially with women, more so not enough protein consumption. So Mm -hmm. getting ample protein can be a big tool. And then usually I don't have to say to keto people getting enough fat, but for many women that are like in the diet mentality and the low fat concepts or looking for calorie cutting, that's kind of the second thing I look at. If you're doing that and you're still dealing with anxiety and you have a close to ideal body composition or a low percent body fat, or you've had recent body fat loss, then you may be dealing with issues with your leptin. So leptin is the hormone that often kind of pairs with insulin. So we think of having insulin resistance in the standard American diet because of such high glucose levels or because of such distress from excessive carb consumption. And what happens with you know intermittent fasting and or a low carb diet with keto is we get insulin sensitivity and then you know the insulin values go down and, and we get into an ideal range of fasting insulin levels and what have you. And that reduces inflammation and helps with weight loss and all these benefits. Well, leptin kind of follows the same suit. And I feel that leptin is what's responsible for the keto high. Like Mm -hmm. (laughs) when you're like rocking it out and you feel like you're walking out of the grocery store and you just want to like pick up a stranger in the parking lot and help them (laughs) for some reason, that's leptin. Like that is leptin and you are like raging leptin. And that's an awesome, beautiful feeling. We all know it. But for people that are like, I lost that, you know, like, oh, I'm still measuring ketones, but I lost my keto high, or I don't have that cognitive hit, or I'm now getting insomnia, I'm not sleeping as well. Often we go from leptin resistance to enhanced leptin docking, which is that hugging a stranger. And then we can go into leptin depletion and leptin gets burned out, especially, like I said, if we don't have enough body fat reserves and we're underfeeding we're over fasting, we're over stressing and over caffeinating or over exercising. (laughs) It's like, who is that? (laughs) And so that trifecta I often see is what really perpetuates the body to be in that fight or flight HPA axis. The body says, I'm in reactive mode. I don't know when Allie's going to feed me next. I don't feel comfortable with these reserves I have here. So I'm going to put the brakes on these processes. We often see reverse T3 go up and that can interfere with our thyroid and that can drive anxiety. And then we also see leptin levels go down and that can also drive and perpetuate anxiety. So even beyond neurotransmitters, we can see a lot of hormone influence that I think can be just as important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I guess with the leptin, how is that something that can be restored? Is it just kind of taking a step back from what you have been doing again, and maybe kind of looking into your own body, doing some things a little bit differently and, and getting that back to baseline? 
Right. So like leptin can be enhanced with good quality omega-3 status. So that's a great natural mood stabilizer anyway, like two grams a day of a combination of EPA and DHA. Those are the active components in your Mm omega-3s and really ramping up fish and wild caught shellfish in the diet to like three to four times a week. That can help with leptin. I generally would recommend for that individual that's doing that trifecta of they got to give something. So if they're like really committed to their spin class, then we have to make sure they're sleeping at least eight hours a night. And we have to probably take a break from intermittent fasting and have them eat something within the first two hours of rise. If they're willing to give up their high intensity interval training, maybe they can keep the fasting, you know? And so it's kind of a little negotiation of this is what's creating distress to your body or fight or flight response. How do we get the body to swing the pendulum back into regulatory function? And I think of both with anxiety, we also see a lot of hypothalamic amenorrhea or loss of period. Mm -hmm. It's the same type of kind of concept, right? It's Mm -hmm. just another symptom that the body's saying, this body is under unpredictable stress mode. It's not safe right now for it to be an optimal regulatory, which is reproductive, metabolic, sleep, and mood stability health, really. Right. So true. Before we move on with the show, I have a great offer to share with you all coming from our friends over at ButcherBox. As most of you know by now, ButcherBox is the go-to source for the highest quality, best tasting meat sourced from happy, healthy animals. And I think we're all aware by now how important that is. For me, it's the only meat I'll eat because it's the only meat I trust these days. Even the meat at the grocery store nowadays that's labeled grass-fed isn't enough for me because many times that cow was still fed grains to fatten him up and they don't have to put it on the label. Cows are not meant to eat grains ever. This causes them to be really sick. They store toxins in their fat, and then we eat it, and it makes us toxic as well. None of this funny business happens with butcher box meat. Their beef is 100% grass-fed, grass-finished. Their pork is heritage breed pork, and their chicken is pasture-raised, which is pretty much impossible to find at a grocery store, yet so important. In order for a chicken to be truly healthy, it needs space to roam and feed off of its natural habitat. This does not happen with mass-produced chicken that most of us are eating today, and that's what's being sold to us. As you can see, I'm super passionate about this topic, the quality of meat I eat and the quality of meat I recommend you eat, and so is ButcherBox. If you haven't already made the switch to better meat and you feel like now is a good time, Go to butcherbox.com slash KFW and get a really great deal. For the month of January, ButcherBox is giving away two pounds of wild Alaskan salmon to every new member who signs up in their first box. That's two pounds of the best quality of salmon you can get. This salmon is awesome. I've tried it. It's beautiful. It's the most wonderful salmon color. That's how you know it really is a good quality piece of fish, and it tastes amazing as well, of course. Again, head to butcherbox.com slash KFW, stands for Keto for Women, and get your hands on this offer, two free pounds of salmon to every new member in their first box. You don't want to miss this opportunity. It is only happening in January 2019. Free salmon, butcherbox.com slash KFW. I promise you, you will not be disappointed that you made this choice Beyond being the best quality meat, it is the best tasting meat I have ever had in my entire life every single time. Their quality is just amazing. And it's delivered right to your door, so you don't even have to do anything. You don't have to go to the store. It's all right there at your doorstep. You put it in the freezer. It's good to go for a month. You've got nothing to worry about. Head to butcherbox.com slash KFW. And let's move on to supplements because that obviously has to play a pretty big role in the whole thing too. Absolutely. So I always am going to layer on adaptogens, especially for the individual that is like the type A go, 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 because we have to bubble wrap essentially (laughs) their thyroid and their adrenals and their stress responding glands from that stress impact. And we don't want them to always shunt out the adrenal 
cortisol and epinephrine, that adrenaline fight or flight response from stress influence. So adaptogens are fantastic. These are things like ginseng, ashwagandha, rhodiola. There's a whole world of mushroom and fungal compounds like cordyceps and reishi. You know, we're learning so much more about the different mycology strains that can help our system to be more resilient. But these are great things that I like to be proactive with in that individual that's high stress, even ideally before they get in the burnout mode of anxiety. And then if they're dealing with anxiety, I love L-theanine and I like to layer in nervines. So adaptogens are herbs that help us to adapt to stress demand and they can help us to not experience like stress-induced fatigue and be more resilient. Whereas nervines are calming in their nature. So these are things like chamomile and the German chamomile is the one that's highest quality, or we're looking at things like skullcap or valerian. These herbs have a somewhat sedative calming nature to them and will reduce that upregulation of that stress response. And then L-theanine is a amino acid compound. It's what's in matcha tea. That's why matcha is so kind of buzzworthy. And it helps our alpha brain waves. So it actually helps with concentration, focus, creative thought process. It helps us to get into a deeper state of REM cycle. And so I have a lot of different combination supplement formulas that I use in my naturally nourished supplement line that I put in different, like a stress support bundle and adrenal rehab and try to guide people in what synergies work well. But those are good entry points along with a quality omega-3 as, as foundation. And then the last thing I'd mention is B vitamins, because there's a huge connection on methylation and mood mood stability and neurotransmitter production. So making sure that you're not taking a complex or a multivitamin that has synthetic Bs, you do not want folic acid or cyanocobalamin, which is spelled with a C. That's a form of B12 that is synthetic. You want methylated folate. So 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, that's a big (laughs) word, but you want to look for the word methyl or methylcobalamin as the more bioavailable forms. And that's going to help about 40 to 50% of the population that have a genetic inability to convert those synthetic forms. Oh, I love it so much. And these are outlined in your book, I'm assuming, with more information on who should be taking what? Oh yeah. There's a whole, so in the end of the book, I actually go in back into each of those R's and I have like my favorite products to reduce inflammation. And we talk about like curcuminoids and turmeric and boswellia and other plant-based compounds. And then the, you know, omega threes, it goes through each section. So we talk about antifungals and the dysbiosis or probiotics and things to consider and look at very, very detailed. <laughs> yeah. I was assuming that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, did, we did mention before we started recording, that there are, for those that are on medication currently, supplements that would not be recommended. Yes. So it's always important with botanicals to make sure that the mechanism of action is understood. So for instance, you know, most drugs that are going to be prescribed are going to be in a reuptake inhibitor. And so we think of most commonly SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There's also drugs like Wellbutrin, which work on our dopamine. And then there's drugs like Effexor, which work on our norepinephrine, and our serotonin. But we want to be mindful that the herb doesn't interfere with that feedback of the receptor that the drug is targeting, or that could drive more mania or you know severe mood impact. So St. John's wort is one that definitely cannot be taken with SSRI drugs. Also, we want to be mindful of things like 5-HTP. So this is the precursor to serotonin. And also even tryptophan, I really like to keep, if someone's on an SSRI, tryptophan only from the food, which is going to be in like your dark poultry, like chicken thighs and things like that. But no tryptophan as a supplement or especially 5-HTP, which is that intermediary building block. Because if you're taking a drug that's modulating the 
receptor feedback and you're also taking the building block, then you're going to get an excessive expression. Now, thinking foundationally, you might want to start with the 5-HTP before trying the SSRI because you'd be adding more tools to the soup pot to scoop from than playing with the feedback. And that may be a better approach, but they can't go hand in hand. You'd have to wean off the drug first. So for those people that come to you on drugs, do you make it a goal to get them off? Well, you know, everyone has their own unique goals and I never like to shame someone for a tool that they're using. So Mm -hmm. by no means is is that an end-all be-all. The end-all be-all is mental clarity, (laughs) balanced hormones, balanced mood, and and how can we get there in a place that seems sustainable with the least side effects possible? Mm -hmm. And so I I by no means would want someone listening to think like, oh gosh, I'm doing something wrong (laughs) by taking this drug. And you know, the biggest goal is to get off. But I will say that as people wean off of their drugs that they've been on, they get enhanced things beyond the anxiety reduction. So whereas the drug may have been reducing their anxiety, they may have also had a really big slump in their libido or sex drive. They may have also started to experience some kind of numbness or apathy Mm -hmm. or brain fog or memory issues. And I will say often using natural compounds and doing neurotransmitter testing and looking at their unique micronutrient needs and imbalances, we often not only address the anxiety, but we optimize other areas that seem non-related. Right. Yeah. So important. You're really looking at it from this whole person perspective and not just that one piece. Yeah, exactly. I call it kind of like upstream medicine versus Mm -hmm. downstream. So it's like we're both addressing the need, but we're also anticipating before the other things show suit. Right. And that's going to create this optimal performance. And if someone's dealing with anxiety now and not currently treating it with any support from a traditional sense, then it would be probably wise to perhaps look at your book first before deciding which path to take, whether to go natural or the traditional medicine route. Yeah, I would say at least because like I said, you could address other things. You might clear up a rash. You might right. enhance your digestion and have a well-formed bowel movement daily now. And or maybe you lose that five pounds of stubborn belly fat because you manage your cortisol. And I think foundational tools for the listeners that are like, I just need somewhere to start. My favorite kind of go-to is like I said, I would definitely look into L-theanine as an awesome tool and maybe switching out your coffee. I know for matcha Mm -hmm. because coffee does drive epinephrine or that adrenaline. So it can perpetuate anxiety for certain. Whereas the matcha has caffeine, but it has that L-theanine in there. So that would be a lifestyle trade out maybe. And then you may even supplement with L-theanine and that can be done safely with all drugs as can magnesium glycinate. That's like one of my favorite. I mean, magnesium is like the original chill pill. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm such a big fan of like two to three cups of leafy greens every day too, in all of my clients, because I want them having that foundation of magnesium. Right, right. Now, obviously, keto fits really well into here. I think we can all kind of agree with that. Us keto ladies out there, that this (laughs) is a really good fit. But is there anybody where that wouldn't be a good fit? Well, I use keto as a component of the anti-anxiety diet specifically, actually, because the same mechanism in which ketones cross the blood-brain barrier, which is how they are so powerful in epilepsy, they actually sit on the receptors and enhance GABA, which is a relaxing neurofeedback chemical, and they reduce that excitatory epinephrine. That same mechanism can support us in feeling grounded and in having less of that high reactive stress response or anxiety type response. Now, If that's not working for someone, that's where I would look deeper into, like I said, things like leptin. Because sometimes over-restricting on both calories, more so calories than carbs is what I see, but over-restricting in general, I think that can happen often in the keto world because you do lose hunger. And I think a lot of the people that I work with at least are type A. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So for some people, keto can become, I think, a negative. It becomes too obsessive, too number focused, and we're over restricting and not, you know, nourishing our body. Oh, so true. I see that 
so, so often, and it really can be damaging. You're doing more harm than good at that point, simply because of the stress it takes, even though you may not necessarily feel that stress. If you think it's easier to count your macros and put everything into an app and calculate every calorie, you may think that's fun, but your body doesn't. And that's not really how we're supposed to be treating our food supply. No, it's like this like tightly wound rubber band <laughs> ball yeah. is kind of how I explain it to clients. And like, you, you can't keep so rigid with things. You need to allow fluidity. And that's when the body finally makes peace and creates this like <sighs> release effect. I truly feel that that's the only hindrance that I can see is the like over obsessing, over numbering, and again, disconnecting from the body feedback. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Now I want to switch just a little bit because something that you talk about quite a bit that I think is really important, I think it probably is part of this anti-anxiety protocol as well, would be toxins and toxicity, especially with keto. And I think that's just something that isn't talked about enough in this community. And I'd love for you to kind of go into what you see. Yeah. So I think that we focus so much in the keto world about what we're not having, right? It's like, no carbs. <laughs> and it's like, you know, okay, okay. How many carbs does this have? Okay. Um, <laughs> gotta look for the word sugar. No sugar. Okay. I'm no sick. fruit, no veggies, yes, no nothing. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. But what are we eating is the question. And so, yes, I mean, when we look at even like non-caloric sweeteners, which just opens a whole can of worms, I suppose, but I am a huge proponent of real foods and I identify a real food by, can you imagine it growing? Are all of its edible parts still intact? And then what's been done to it since harvest, right? So like how many modifiable steps have taken corn to white powdered erythritol? Mm. And am I going to make a product with that in my kitchen for my toddler and say that this is nourishing whole real food? Or am I going to soak four dates in water and puree that, which each individual portion is still going to have not net, but 10 total grams of carbs. And I probably added almond flour, coconut oil, ghee, (laughs) an Mm -hmm. avocado or whatever other fats. And so it's still likely a three to one ratio. And yet, yeah, I call that real food keto. And so I think that I break a lot of rules in that sense when I use this, is this a whole food? Can you imagine it growing? Because my concern is just because the end day of what we stamp on its metabolic influence of does this provoke an insulin response at the end of the day, there's other things happening like endocrine disrupting influence of chemicals and additives. There's microbiome disrupting influence of chemicals and additives. And so a lot of these fillers, a lot of these things that we can stamp on keto approved products like non-caloric sweeteners and a lot of these fiber fillers and stabilizers, they can create a lot of havoc to our gut lining, our gut population of bacteria, and some of them have neurotoxin influence as well, especially if they're derived from like a GMO corn crop in the first place. And then there's a lot of chemical solvents and hexalents in that extraction process. I love the idea of how many steps did it take before it actually became edible? (laughs) You know, that's really important. Like when you gave the example of the erythritol, it doesn't just come out of the ground like that. (laughs) You have to have like a Breaking Bad lab, like in your yeah, office, exactly. like, serious stuff. <laughs> like at that point, I just would not trust that. And it doesn't, I mean, I personally think it tastes disgusting too, but you know, it just really, really makes a big difference to think about it that way and to really think about all the other processes that it may be affecting besides just that one thing that we're so obsessed with in keto, which is our blood sugar, which is of course, super, super important, but yeah. you know, taking the dates and putting that into some sort of mix that has really good, awesome, healthy fats is not going to do anything different to your blood sugar than the erythritol. Right. And like, you know, roasting some butternut squash and eating seasonally and locally, Mm -hmm. having a quarter cup or even an eighth cup, if that fits your fancy. And I love roasting butternut squash in either coconut oil or lard. It's really good. And some Mm -hmm, fresh lard. (laughs) Yes. And so doing that in like, I love to do maybe two tablespoons or three tablespoons in a salad 
with a really great vinaigrette and some roasted Brussels sprouts and whatever protein I'm eating that night, that's not only satiating, it allows my palate to stay calibrated to that being like an indulgence that is a sweet. It's not this hyper fake sense of sweet, but also I'm getting things like lutein and different phyto compounds that help neurological function. And so when we're talking about the therapeutic application of keto and and really using keto as medicine, as a tool. I'm so excited to be a proponent in this movement of a whole food approach because we get these unique bioflavonoids when we liberalize to a whole food perspective that we otherwise wouldn't have. And we might be removing some neurotoxin or disrupting compounds from those fillers. Oh, so, so good. Okay. Well, this leads me to my next question, which is what does your keto plate look like right now? Oh, like what I ate yesterday or whatever. Yeah. Just in this current (laughs) season. I'm like, what did I have? (laughs) I mean, it's kind of hard to remember what you had to eat the day before. I think when people ask me that, I'm like, I have no idea, but just in general, what are you really into right now? Okay. So right now, so we're in winter season of foods. So I have been playing with a bunch of different fun types of winter squash Mm -hmm. and leafy greens. So (laughs) I am doing tonight a massage kale salad. It's kind of thinking back to my uh, vegan roots. Yum. And so I use lacinato, like the dino kale. That's the stuff that's a little sweeter. And I'll take that off the stems, chop that up, and then I massage it with my Himalayan salt. And then I will be doing tonight a vinaigrette with, well, I guess a salad dressing, no vinegar, lime juice, cumin, garlic, and olive oil. And then I picked up some pomegranates because it's kind of like festive, (laughs) holiday-ish. I peeled my first pomegranate yesterday. First time ever. It's kind of fun. Oh, totally. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Did you do it underwater? Yeah. 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 Yep. That's the trick. (laughs) Yes, it was good. Yeah, so we'll be sprinkling that on the salad with a little bit of, actually, I just mentioned roasted Brussels sprouts and then chopped up bacon. And tonight's protein is pork and beef meatballs. So wow. that's what I'm eating tonight. <laughs> you all, always make such elaborate plates. <laughs> well, so I'll keep that dressing, you know, shelf stable. I, I don't refrigerate it because the olive oil will get chunky. So mm-hmm. if I make a dressing, I make it for three to five days. So mm-hmm. that's like there. And then, yeah, I mean, the meatballs I'll have then tomorrow for lunch. And so I cook four times a week as like an entree. And then I do a lot of what I call adult lunchables for lunch, where I just like snack Piccadilly, like it might be half an avocado with fermented sauerkraut and some Marcona almonds, some olives, and then maybe like some in-house roasted turkey. And I just kind of like hodgepodge that. Oh, I love it. So, you know, it's not always like a beautiful aesthetic, but it, it does the trick and it's all whole real food for sure. And does your toddler eat the same? She does. So she, I don't restrict her as far as keto, but I do, as I say, I don't restrict her, but Mm -hmm. she's, she's never had a grain yet. Mm -hmm. So she is kind of, I guess I would say the word paleo is the most appropriate, but she does dairy, cultured dairy, unless she has like phlegm or mucus, then we totally pull out dairy. And that's a big one for kiddos with ear infections that, you know, I really try to share with parents, the dairy phlegm, Mm -hmm. it's a big one to watch in this season because they just don't know how to blow their noses. They constantly suck it back in. (laughs) And you know, it's true though. They just, and then that all gets congested and that's where we get ear infections. And that's, you know, the number one cause of antibiotic use. And I think that's a huge impact on our little one's health right away. So things to be mindful of. That's a really good tip. All right. Well, let's finish up by telling everyone a little bit more about where they can find you, the book, your practice, all that good stuff. Okay. So we try to keep it super simple for you guys. And everything is pretty much Allie Miller RD. So it's A-L-I-M-I-L-L-E-R-R-D. So like social media is at Allie Miller RD. My website is (laughs) AllieMillerRD.com. And you can get the anti-anxiety diet wherever books are sold. So totally go support your local bookstore, buy it at Barnes and Noble or your mom and pa bookstore and ask Mm -hmm. for it on the shelf if they don't have it. Or you can get it on Amazon or on my website. I have a section called books and programs. And that's where I have a bunch of different eBooks and such as well. And you mentioned you have a supplement line for the one specifically that you mentioned. 
Yeah. So the one with the L-theanine and the nervines and adaptogens is called Calm and Clear. And that literally people do say it saves marriages. So (laughs) I think it may have. Well, that's important. I know, right? I've been been taking it for like five years, so I don't know. I'm still here. (laughs) And yeah, we have a whole line. It's some 35 different items that are all third party assessed and tested for potency and purity. And I use them in my functional medicine clinic and they're available for public use. And that's on AllieMillerRD.com under shop. And your clinic is where? So it's all virtual. So I just work from home. Yeah. And I work with clients over video conference or phone and Things are getting pretty rocked. I think I've booked into September of 2019. (laughs) Well, we've got a while to wait. Yeah, I'm not taking many new clients now, but that's where it's been really fun developing tools Mm -hmm. like this book, which you're not self-diagnosing. You're actually using, like I said, the quizzes and such and being able to bring in interventions. And I do offer all of my functional labs to the public and I do a customized email review. So you can actually test like your hormones or food sensitivities and all these things as well directly through my clinic. That's awesome. Allie, thank you so much for coming on the show today. That was a really, really great combo, which I knew it would be. (laughs) It was a power hour. It was It was. (laughs) It totally was. Thank you so much. And we'll have to do this again sometime. Sounds good. It's my pleasure. Thank you. All right, that will do it for today's chat. Thanks again to Allie so much for coming on the Keto for Women show today and sharing all of her knowledge in that episode. I'm sure you all have some really good stuff to take home from that. And don't forget to check her out on Instagram and her website at AllieMillerRD.com. You can find me at SeanMiner.com. Also make sure to check me out on Instagram and Facebook at SeanMiner and SeanMinerHealth. And don't forget, if you haven't already, I would absolutely love to hear what you're thinking of the show over on iTunes. Head over there, leave a five-star review. Let me know what you're loving. It will help so many other women find the help they need to get to a keto lifestyle that works for them. This is how we all do our part to get the word out there about the wonderful healing benefits of this lifestyle as long as it's approached the right way for a female body. I read every single review that you have. I love every single one. I give you all a big virtual hug when that happens. So head over there, do me a favor, do everyone else in the keto space a favor and make sure you let me know what you think. Thank you so much. And until next time, take care. Take care.